All right, folks, it's been a good day today and another exciting day here with everything that we've got going on and a number of great things are happening in our community. And we definitely appreciate y'all joining the radio show with Mark Lee. As a matter of fact, I just started the show off without starting off with the theme. Silly me. So let's start off with the theme and then I'll come back. Hey, we've actually got our guest with us as well. So definitely uh, glad we've got David Archer and looking forward to a great conversation with him and everything. So I'm going to bring him into the conversation. But first, let's get back here and get the uh, correct theme going and all of that. We were just doing an amazing event. We've had two podcasting friends of mine that I was on a conversation with earlier and uh, sharing some thoughts with them. And that being Cara, who's been on our shows here, as well as Deb, who's got a podcasting coaching thing that she does. But right now, let's start off with the official thing. Yep, so much is going on in the world. I know a lot of folks are concerned about definitely what's happening in the sense of the uh, virus and the pandemic that we're in the the middle of and all of that. And, of course, a number of folks are also paying attention to what's going to be happening with the um, inauguration that is coming our way on um, Wednesday. That's right, the inauguration, which I understand will probably be mostly a virtual inauguration, will be taking place on Wednesday, and a lot of folks are very much concerned about how that's going to play out because of what happened two weeks ago and all of that. So I do know that a lot of the states are under alert and are trying to pay attention to some of these outside factors that are going on that are doing a lot of negative energy and all of that. So we're definitely going to be talking about that on this show because my guest today has definitely got some thoughts about how we can do better in terms of race relations and a number of other things as well. So definitely was glad to get David on to the show and to talk to him more about the great work that he is doing and all of that. So without any further ado, get ready to bring David Archer on and learn more about all the amazing things that he is doing in the world and all of that. So David, I'm glad that you were able to join me and to um, us to have a conversation about a number of things. As I was just saying, I know a lot of folks have been concerned about uh, what happened with the um, insurrection. And that's all I can call it is an insurrection that took place here in America earlier, as well as the fear of what could be even happening in another couple of days. And I know that a lot of your work is around the, uh, while it's around psychology, it's also around race relations and things along that line. (laughs) So I'd love to hear more about what you've got going on in your work and even some of your thoughts about where we are as a society. And I know that you're over there in Canada, but you're definitely observing what's going on in America. And I know that there are even some things that are happening there similar in Canada. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as to what's going on in your observations here in America. Sure. So thank you again, Mark, for having me on the show. Uh, First, I want to preface this by saying that I'm coming from the perspective of of a therapist. And so some of the things that we've seen happen in the past uh, few weeks, we, as like from the therapist perspective, um, it's not only that we look at things from, uh, from one event, but it's often helpful for us to look at a pattern uh, of events as well. And sometimes when we're able to kind of look at what's happened in the past, um, it kind of puts what happens in the present in a bit of a more understandable context. Uh, the the only thing is that I'm not a historian, so I won't be able to go too far back. And also, as you mentioned, is that I'm not an American. Uh, I happen to, to live in a place called Canada. Uh, the original name of the, the city, we call it Montreal, but originally it was called Jogjaga, and that's the name that the Iroquois Confederacy would have given it. And that itself is very important for us to understand because what that means is that I'm actually living on unceded territory. Um, And that kind of puts it into perspective for me. So while I was talking to some people, they're like, wow, I'm surprised. All of this stuff is going on. Um, As I said, I'm not a historian, but I know that 
the way how the formation of my country took place and the formation of how your country took place was not necessarily unicorns and rainbows, that the only way how our countries could have been formed is through uh, the genocide of indigenous people. So if, for example, there was violence that took place uh, that originated uh, the, uh, the, the land so that it could be uh, uh, taken from the previous inhabitants, if my ancestors were not uh, taken and used in order to, uh, to uh, facilitate so-called cheap labor, if there was not centuries of violence, centuries of this uh of this destructive nature then i think it would have come to a surprise to me as well but um for us to really just say that it's that it was like a one-time thing and and that uh you know i've heard uh a lot of people say that this is something that they believe is uh is un-american well, we have to understand that there's a global precedent that takes place this is something that uh, that we're not really touched on the, in the West. We're not touched by these things. But there's always times on the news that we'll see like videos of uprisings and, and violence that takes place in, in people's nation's capitals. But I do think that it's especially difficult for us because it makes it feel as if we're all one world community, that it's no longer this belief of American exceptionalism, is that now... America is starting to resemble uh, other countries. And now we're all un united in this idea of how are we going to get out of this? But I, I, I do want to say, if I can continuing, continue with my rambling answer, is uh, it's just to say that it's a confluence of many things that you saw took place at that capital. Um, although I do believe that there's aspects of white supremacy and, uh, and racial uh, violence that's a part of it, it's also the economic system and capitalism that's a part of it as well. Because many of those people you saw there were not necessarily the richest people. In fact, there were people from all walks of life. There were, you know, they're finding out all types of people were involved. So this is a moment not to really despair. This is a moment for us to, to have self-reflection. So if any of my clients were in a crisis, as you saw, when in, what occurred was technically a crisis. But when my clients are in a crisis, we have to reflect on what it means. We have to understand the pattern from where it came from. And we have to address the underlying trauma that is probably unprocessed and unresolved that allows those types of things to happen in the first place. That makes a lot of sense, and you brought up some very interesting points and everything. I actually have some Native American background in my own family tree and all yeah. of that, and there's some relatives that live there in uh, um, Canada. Actually, in fact, one of my cousins, Will, runs a, um, like a whole fashion uh, line that he does out mm -hmm. of that area with his wife and everything because he actually went up to Canada and married somebody that was more traditionally out of the Canadian Indian community yeah. and all of that. So he definitely has been up there for a number of years and all of that. And I know that part of what you talk about, which is something that is very much popular a lot in this day and everything, is mm -hmm. this kind of concept of um, anti-racism. And I know that definitely um, Mr. Kende has done some work similar to what you have done. But what is your approach to anti-racism and how can we do a better job of trying to be, uh, get more folks to understand how they can be anti-racist? Okay. Well, it's a good, it's a good question. And again, is that um, I find that there are some people who have different perspectives and definitions of it. For me, um, as I was going to probably explain at some point, I'm writing a book called Anti-Racist Psychotherapy, Confronting Systemic Racism and Healing Racial Trauma. And so my perspective of anti-racism may not be the same as uh, Dr. Kendi's. It may not be the same as the everyday activist who's actually out on the streets. But um, I kind of look at anti-racism as a, as a form of liberation. Um, I notice that many of my clients that... Um, because typically this is what happens, is that there's a social aspect to the reason why a person will present themselves to a therapy. So, for example, you'll get the person who's in a domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. You'll get a person who is depressed, who suffers from anxiety. Um, but what's interesting is that if you're mm -hmm. talking to a person 
in a domestic violence situation and you have a taboo or a discomfort about talking about relationships, you're probably going to get nowhere. If you're talking to someone who is depressed and you may not feel comfortable talking about suicide or sadness, you're probably going to lose steam. And so the same type of thing occurs is that every single person is caught up in the spectrum of this false social construction of race. Either you're a black person or you're a white person or you're something in between. And so if we're unable to have a space where we can talk about this primary way of organizing and structuring uh, our social uh, our social groupings, so if we can't talk about race, then I think that there's, it's also a failure on our part as therapists. So the way how I work is I, I think it's really important for us to at least have the door open where we can think about what race is but also that we can look at what's called racial trauma. And so I use approaches that are designed to help uh, for trauma resolution. There's EMDR, there's brain spotting, there's EFT, there's thousands of different ways. There's not only just my way, and, and I, I'm not, not saying that it's only my definition that should be applied, but I really look at being able to resolve traumas as a way of being able to confront um, uh, the uh, the the things that keep back feminism. If you're able to help a person who identifies with the LGBTQ community to be proud of themselves, then you're confronting the social structure that leaves in place barriers for them. And the same exact thing for black people as well, is that when I'm helping a person overcome their anger, overcome their sadness, or their self-confidence to help them to see themselves as the beautiful person that they are, then that in effect is also anti-racist. I think any therapist is able to to help a person to become proud of themselves, but it's just that it's important to to know that if we don't talk about race, if we're not if we're caught up in this idea of race as being taboo, as mental health as being taboo, then we're not necessarily able to free ourselves from these things that trigger these things that may seem surprising to some people. Um, I said it on another. Um, event but it's just to say that what we saw at the capitol mm -hmm. is very similar to what you might see in a person who has maybe for years and years repressed their early years of violence if we look at the creation of your country and our countries if we can even call them countries at all but that's a topic for another time but it's really to say that if in the early creation of the country there was violence and if in our present day understanding of our identity in countries, we don't talk about the violence, we don't talk about exactly what took place, then there's a sense of repression that goes on. There's a sense of putting it down, putting a blanket over it. But no matter where we go in our home, we trip over that, over the, over the carpet. <laughs> like we, it's impossible to hide that elephant that's in the room. And so just, just to say that um, these early events that took place they have been repressed. We haven't really come to terms with them. And so then just like a client that you would have is that they'd get flashbacks of a traumatic event that takes place. And all we're seeing is just a flashback. These are uh, the white race uh, riots, what people may call like white lash. These things are common in your in your country's history in that whenever we see black advances, then we see this type of response. So this is it's logical to uh, to see it. It's just that it's not pleasant. Um, but if we do not address race, we're doing a disservice. And so anti-racism then is a way of liberation. It's a way of us being able to acknowledge our past and also to be able to, to be proud of who we are, regardless of our so-called social uh, constructed uh, identities that are there. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I was watching, I think it was either last week or the week before, a um, documentary on uh, the gentleman that is actually um, – the son of the founder of the, uh, or the author of the Turner Diaries, which we know a lot of the racist groups kind of use that as their kind of like a go-to book and all of that. And apparently he's gotten very much away from that um, book that his dad published um, and everything because he found that 
his dad was actually being abusive to him and all of that. And he's had to come to terms with a lot of that and everything. And he's actually doing a lot of work around racism and everything, even though his dad is, I think, long past and everything. But he was Mm -hmm. definitely the creator of that book. And now the son is trying to um, come to a better understanding of what all of that hatred and uh, vitriol meant even in his own development. And he talks about how he even uh, was being abused if he even said he wanted to play sports because Mm -hmm. if he played sports, he was, of course, going to have to be around a number of uh, Mm African-American youth and everything. So his dad was vehemently opposed to that. And he talks about in this whole uh, news piece that I watched and everything, how he was like literally beaten by his dad. And now he's Mm -hmm. come to terms with a lot of this domestic violence that he went through as he was being um, developed into the racist that he became. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it's really to say that um, um, I'll, I'll kind of I'll try my best to extend off of that. It's just to say um, I've never met uh, like a child like a, if you've ever seen on the playground and how sometimes there could be bullies right. uh, and then the bully will attack a person who is not a bully. And uh, and it's like. I've never seen a bully who actually came from a perfectly adapted household. You know what I mean? I've never seen a bully who came from a household where there's complete unconditional love and, and like, you know, like a positive environment from where they come from and validation that doesn't happen. And so the way how it is, um, is that sometimes our parents, they can only teach us what they've learned. And so the bully can only teach the victim of the bully what they themselves have learned. But that's why we are seeing, so it's not only this thing of, like, it's a false idea to say that um, that all white people are are uh, the same as the people who stormed in, in the building and all that stuff. Because we're also seeing a big surge of white people that are starting to realize that they've, they're, they're kind of fed up with this whole uh, racism thing, too. I'm seeing a lot of a lot of people turning up from all different types of communities. So even if our parents, they themselves had some racist beliefs, um, it's not too late to come on this the right side of history. <laughs> like it's not too late because we know this is, is the wrong it's the wrong side of history. But still, I mean, we're having this talk on the day of a uh, Martin Luther King Day, right. and we know that even Martin Luther King, he was really. Uh, unpopular around the time that he was uh, uh, assassinated. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still just to say, though, is that there's no one who can argue and say that he wasn't he wasn't at least trying to improve humanity in the world. No one can really say that about his legacy. The same with Martin Luther, uh, with uh, Malcolm X. The same, like there's so many there's so many other civil rights leaders. But it's it's really just to say that is that some people are starting to realize that. The only way out of this is when we're all free. No, I definitely agree with you on that. And you actually brought up an interesting point, both of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And we actually did a uh, show yesterday that kind of touched on that legacy that he had and everything. I'm actually of the opinion that he would be highly frustrated that some almost 60 years away from his famous I Have a Dream speech, that a lot of the things that he was talking about, whether that's food insecurities, whether that's race relations, whether that's kind of our uh, view of being a um the colonial kind of side of being a world power and all yeah. of that and a number of other things that he was very vehemently against because a lot of folks forget how much he was against the Vietnam War and all mm-hmm. of that but I was wondering what is your opinion of what do you think Dr. King would be thinking about this modern day era that we're in in 2021 both there in canada as well as here in the u.s and throughout the globe well if dr king was able to come back and talk to us in this day and time what do you think his reaction would be to what's going on in the world (laughs) well the thing is that um uh oh martin luther king and malcolm x these were both uh, men of god and if i can bring a little bit of spirituality into it just to say that they were at a time where um, there was a lot of of violence towards black people that was taking place. I don't know if they would necessarily be disappointed. I think that this was their thing that was their calling. So it's just to say that when we interpret it in terms of a calling instead of just something that needs to be done or that there's a, 
that there is like um like a, a set of uh, so-called smart goals they do in businesses sometimes. Um, the calling it takes place uh, beyond like like they they weren't necessarily aiming for something to take place in their lifetime, and we know this from what they what they've said in their in their words. So I think that there are still some protesters who are like 80 years old who showed up to Black Lives Matter protests. Mm-hmm. I think that this is not the time to be discouraged. This is the time to really to um, to just continue the same the same fight. And I think what's interesting is uh, I don't know what they would say in this current day and age. But what's fascinating is if you go onto YouTube and listen to any other talks, it feels like they're talking about right now. Yeah, that's that's the thing that's really interesting. So I don't know what they would say specifically today, but there's a lot that we can learn about and a lot of knowledge that they had in the past that is still very relevant. And that to me is why like these are these are heroes that will always forever be remembered in history, because what these were people who were ahead of their time. Yes, yeah, interesting you said that because we did play a couple of the speeches. We played um, the uh, speech, uh, "Where do we go from here?" Um, mm-hmm. Chaos or community, and we also played, of course, um, the "I Have a Dream" speech and everything. But in the uh, chaos and community speech, he actually addresses the whole concept of police um, violence and police abuse. Yeah, he might have been talking there about it in go. the sense of like. Um, the more Jim Crow kind of things, but still the way he was talking about it, it could definitely be, as you just said, it could be relevant to today. And even with Malcolm X, I think about that famous, um, what happens when the chickens come home to roost yeah. kind of speech that could be very much relevant to today yeah. as well. So uh, there are definitely these kind of speeches that resonate in 2021, even though they were made in the early sixties and everything along those lines and everything. I did I want to talk a little bit more about the whole racism and all of that. But one of the other things that I was kind of curious to hear your mm-hmm. viewpoints about and everything sure. is that a lot of times, we as a people, meaning, and I mean that of all the minority people, African Americans, Native Americans, I would even argue the Latin American community, we sometimes become afraid of going into to therapy. We have a hard enough time going to our regular doctors. We really don't want to see a therapist or things along that line. So as one that has been trained in therapy, how do you get people to understand the importance sure. of therapy and to understand that it is something that they don't necessarily need to be afraid of and that they need to have it as part of their regular medical regimen and uh and gotcha. i'd also love to hear your, your thoughts about this rise in there seems to be a rise in the wellness movement but i don't know that there's a rise in the, the therapy movement it seems to be that there should be a rise in both of them that's interesting okay so just a few things one thing i want to say though is that uh when we use the term uh, minority it's very important for us to understand that um we may be racial minorities in these specific countries but part of the rage that you're seeing at the capital is because the population demographics are going to change significantly mm-hmm. and i think 2040 i think that's when white people will be a minority well, okay so that's why we we got to get ready and we got to find out ways of being able to not look at ourselves as minorities because uh we're actually part of the global majority because most people actually most people are not white in the world (laughs) but it's just when because what happens is when we live in our societies we only look at the world through the through the the uh the eurocentric lens so that's why we're we're comfortable maybe thinking that we're minorities but there's actually more of us than than we we actually think and this i'm not even going to get into talking about how Um, Africans many times are kind of excluded from conversations in part because what uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, what they were trying to do was they were trying to unify and like try to say we're part of a global community. They didn't like that. Malcolm X was trying to make it about uh, a human rights. uh, What's it called? He's trying to go to the United Nations and all that. Because if we start to think of this as like a global issue, not just a local issue, then it's possible that I can change. It's it's really possible that um, because okay well it's, it's it's like there's a hundred things I wanted to say about your thing but the reason why Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are able to say things that still resonate today is because the structure didn't necessarily change the structure of white supremacy and all that are still constant and they're still consistent and their modes of operation are still the same 
in our institutions, there still are disparities depending on who has knowledge and who doesn't and who should be the recipient of like certain services and who and who shouldn't. Uh, this is even at the expense of white people that many laws like in the States, they don't you guys don't have like the health care and all that stuff. Uh, they have that in many other countries. Um, uh, but it's like there still is this maintenance of trying to keep people down even at the expense of white people so there's there's a lot of like things like the maintenance of poverty because poverty itself is socially constructed so there's a lot of things that are ending up um as you said like the chickens coming home to roost um i look i look at uh white supremacy more as a, a glass cannon that it's very strong but it it completely collapses on itself if it's used way too much and this is this is what we're seeing live and direct. So, but uh, one of the reasons why it can be hard for us who identify as you know racial minorities in a country in countries where um, you know the majority is uh, white people, um, it's because we don't see ourselves reflected in the in the people who provide the service. For me. It's like I kind of became a therapy a therapist because it was a polarity response. People said I can't do it. I'm like, really? Okay, let's let's go and see that. My mother's Jamaican. Okay, right. my parents are my parents are Jamaican, so it's like uh, Jamaicans like it's all about work ethic. It's all about like you know it's every single day when I'd wait like I'd see my father go to work, wake up way before me, he's gone like even before I wake up, and so he'd always be working. So it's kind of to say that like this idea that we can't make it. Uh, if we know the history of Jamaica, like uh, Jamaicans, we don't play around them. Like when it's time to work, like we, we get to work. So like, it's just to say that it makes a lot of sense why there'd be any hesitant, uh, any like hesitation about like going to see a therapist because therapists need to speak a bit more about race and they need to do their own homework. But that's what I'm trying to like advance is that um, it's not necessarily that you need to only have a black therapist. Um, but if there are white therapists and white therapists as well need to, un they need to do their own work on their, on their white racism. Cause the, this, the way to become a therapist involves going through a white institution. So it's very possible that if you go through a white institution, when you come out of it, you may still espouse ideas of whiteness. So even if it is a black therapist, you can technically still uh uh like have implicit biases that a white person would have so this is why regardless of the person's race i would say that um like we i still need to like check myself and like learn to decolonize my own way of speaking and, and understand and learn more but i want to say that for people who want to maybe consider black uh, uh who are black who are like latin american who are considering about going to therapy this is the reason why we need more of you guys in this field we need to get better representation in in this thing because there's there's something really special about going to a therapist and being able to just you know like to to kind of be yourself and to be able to to talk about race to talk about gender sexuality whatever it is that that the taboo exists regardless like of who you are immigration and all that without any fear of judgment and so uh it's to say um what i want to say though is that it's so important for us to increase our numbers in in these fields so that we can start to give the therapy that works for us and the only way that that's going to happen is there's less taboo about it but um it's also going to have it's it's that we need to support ourselves to, to to go into unconventional fields like therapy what do you think are some of the stereotypes that people have of therapy? Like I said, I know there are a number of them, but what are some of the ones that you feel that we need to work as, as a society to address and to try to get away from? Because I know a lot of times when people think of therapy, they think of the, and I hate to put it this, but the kind of the Hollywood version of therapy. Yeah. They, think, they think of Frasier. They think of like yeah, kind yeah. of that TV version of what <laughs> therapy is about. And that is very much of a European view of therapy. Even Frasier was very European oriented and everything along that line, even yeah. with his radio talk show that was part of the theme of his TV show and everything, right. but it was very much very much of an Anglo kind of focus, but I was wondering, is that part of the problem? Is it so much of an Anglo focus and Anglo stereotypes, or what do you think are some of the 
uh, stereotypes that folks have about therapy in general, particularly in our community. All right. Well, there's some people that because there's a lot of like misinformation about what therapy is. Right. And I think that that's uh, the therapist's responsibility. I think my field has done it could be doing a bit more about really letting people know what we do. But there's a lot of mysticism about it of like it's kind of like a secret. But um, uh, I could start off with just the definition of how I see what psychotherapy is, because psychotherapy right. itself is really designed help a person to learn okay it's very similar to education um education is kind of like to help a person to recognize that they're that they have the capacity to overcome obstacles and like that's the reason why you need to pass uh, elementary school first then you go to high school high school teaches you to get into in quebec we have a thing called seeds up before high school so then high school teaches you to get to CJEP. CJEP teaches you to get to your college or your university or any of that stuff. So the knowledge builds upon itself. And I believe that psychotherapy, when it's done right, is also in that in that respect, is that you're helping a person to, to tune into their inner resources to overcome their inner obstacles. So you're really, it's not necessarily the therapist who is the, the answer to everything. My job is really just to provide a context where the person can tap into their own skills. And um, when I talk to my clients uh, before before they become my clients, uh, that's the reason why I like to have a phone call with them to uh, kind of like assess like where what what are their perspectives about what's going to happen. People are like, "Are you going to hypnotize me? Are you going to brainwash me?" And I'm like, "No, that doesn't that doesn't happen. I don't have a pendulum. And I don't." Uh, my watch is on my cell phone. I look at the screen and it tells me the time. Um, but I do want to say, though, is that there's a lot of misinformation even about hypnosis of what hypnosis is, is able to do. So there's there's just a lot of like, um, uh, generally, there's a lot of like misunderstandings about these things. But no, I don't have a couch that anyone sits on. This is a time of COVID. I, people are staying home. Let's do it virtually. And it's just, but uh, what I do, though, is called EMDR. And it still is based in the West. It still is a Western way of doing things. But instead of it just being about talking, it's also about helping a person to uh, find ways of keeping themselves in the present. Because whenever a person is depressed or like stressed about things that happened in the past or traumatized, it's almost as if they have like two feet in the past. When a person's anxious or they're preoccupied about things that didn't happen, it's almost like they got two feet in the future, but the approach that I use, the psychotherapy that I use is, is designed to make it so you could get at least one foot in the present, focus on the past, and then eventually bring both feet in, in the present. This is what we talk about relating to mindfulness. This is what we talk about relating to uh, being emotional regulation, feeling grounded and all these things. And so... Um, it's to say, though, is that even if you are using tools that were structured in the West, it's so important for us to keep our mindset about like um, about the values that that are like outside of the West. So I have a Western modality, but my approaches do relate to what's called Afrocentric uh, uh, psychology and approaches that enable us to, to kind of conceptualize more than just the individual but the family that the individual comes from more than just what's going on, but to understand the past of where they come from to, so that we can better understand the future. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, so just, just to say uh, one more thing yeah. is that it's not so much about just uh, the sword. It's uh, more so about the samurai. It's not mm -hmm. just about like, like the, the, the purse. It's not just about like the tool that they're using, but it's the, it's, it's the heart that's behind the person who's who's like using the tool and so it's a lot of work that i do on myself so that i can help others to to do work on themselves no and i know we always have to work on ourselves on a regular basis and i was just wondering would you agree with me that it does seem like a lot of our society in the west and i would use definitely canada uh mm -hmm. definitely north america a number of the other places even europe and everything that we've gotten away from a lot of the more traditional therapy and we're now going more into this mindfulness kind of like uh attitude i know a lot of people are getting into yoga they're getting into meditation they're getting mm -hmm. into a number of these mindfulness kind of tools which i think are 
important in terms of like grounding us and helping us have that kind of like um, true uh, unity that we need. Cause I definitely yeah. believe that we are definitely spiritual beings, mental beings, emotional beings, as mm-hmm. well as a number of other elements of our uh, psyche and everything. But it does seem that right now, a lot of our, focus has been on that kind of wellness community. I don't know if you think that that's something that should be done in conjunction with therapy or that that's something that it's, you can do one without the other or should they be done um, in unity. But I do see a lot of folks that are pushing that wellness aspect of their life. We have a number of even life coaches are pushing that wellness aspect. Yeah. So, I mean, that debate, I mean, uh, I would be really biased because I, I, <laughs> I've chosen my side and my side has, has chosen me. But what I can say, though, is that mindfulness really is, I think it's something that came came about like maybe like either 4,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago, but a long time. And also there's like, I think that there's some Egyptian hieroglyphs that show that there's positions and postures that look like yoga. So it's really to say that mindfulness is really is an old, old form of uh, like, I think that when like, even like in the stories of the Buddha, that when they were conceptualizing meditation, I think Buddha was maybe one of the first psychoanalysts that this, like back then they were trying to solve the problems of suffering. What we're seeing in the wellness community possibly is just an, a cultural appropriation of mindfulness because many of these people who are yoga instructors, I don't know if they look like uh, people who uh, who might have originated yoga. I don't know if the melanin is the same. I don't know. I don't, like The thing is, is just to say that there's some aspects where we're going to take from a, from a culture and be like, okay, this is yoga, uh, but do we really understand like how how yoga came about? Do we really understand about the racial consequences of like propping up certain people as being the, the best people, like the experts? So I'm cautious about all of that stuff about about experts and all that. But I can say though that wellness is not a bad thing. I'm going to say also that mindfulness is is not a bad thing. Uh, I believe that there's many many paths to the truth. There may be one truth. In, in the world, but there's many ways to get to it. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to say that it's not only the therapist that has all the answers. There's some life coaches who really are really like on point. There's some like yoga instructors, regardless of their, their appearance, they are really on point and true and true to it. But in any field, you're going to get those who are the realist and those who are kind of uh, trying to, to be a uh, surreal. So and speaking of surreal, I know that one of the other things that I find a lot of times that people, when they think about, and you had actually alluded to this earlier in the conversation, when they think about therapy and particularly psychotherapy, they automatically go to the historical figures, which are very much European oriented. I mean, mm-hmm. how many times have we heard about Sigmund Freud? How many mm-hmm. times have we heard about Jung? How many times have we heard about a number of these other great European uh, therapists or psychologists and things of that nature who had their own viewpoints, but I find it oftentimes it was very much of a Eurocentric kind of view, yeah. and it sounds to me that George is very much not necessarily going in that mindset and things along that line. So what do you do when folks try to tell you that you're not necessarily espousing the views of a number of these kind of like icons? Because I do think that sometimes they become almost iconic figures that can do no wrong, even though I think that some of their (laughs) viewpoints may not be all the way right for every society, including the minority society. But we do have Mm -hmm. some folks that are very much all about, you know, either the Freudian view or the young view or a number of other kind of views that are out there. There are some existentialists as well that they might be very much into as well, but definitely they seem to be stuck on that kind of European and Eurocentric view of mm-hmm. psychotherapy. And it seems to me that a lot of your work is trying to demystify some of this kind of stereotypes and all of that. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think that, um, uh, I'll say it in a in a different way, but um, in the summer we were seeing people topple down statues of colonizers, right. and that, that was such a powerful thing. It was very interesting. It was in a way like the current generation renegotiating its past and renegotiating who they want to be and who should be remembered. And I think that um, uh, I think her her name is Bree Newsom. She's yes. the person who climbed up. 
the, the yeah okay and they climbed up a, a flagpole and took down the confederate flag and she is one of the first pe- this happened a year a few years back right. and so she got a lot of negative press about it but it's it's just to say that like um we are constantly trying to renegotiate our past and we're constantly trying to identify who we are and i don't think that there is i don't know the perfect way of doing it but i will say that um Although I disagree with many of what Freud was, uh, many of the things that Freud was trying to to say at the time, and there are some limits of what he was allowed to say because he was Jewish, but he couldn't talk really about Jewishness because there was a lot of racism in a thing called World War II that was on the horizon. So he couldn't, and so he had to make it seem as scientific as possible so that it wouldn't be seen or interpreted as a Jewish science. Um, Carl Jung said some problematic things in the past, but look, I, I don't want to just like spend too much time just uh, criticizing these people because it's that um, uh, uh, psychotherapy must evolve. Right. So there is like a certain type of like foundation that these people created that made it so that psychotherapy exists in this form today. So it's difficult for me to say that what they're saying is completely wrong and I'm the one who's correct. It's like, um, I was talking to someone this morning about that, is that uh, there was a time when, um, uh, what's it called? Like Moses, it said that Moses said, everything that came before me is wrong. And it's just, and there's no other gods except for this one. But then that begs the question of what gods were there before? So it's really to say that maybe there was a psychotherapy that was super effective that existed before Freud. Although we're going to say that he's the father of it, maybe there was something that was like really, really effective that it, that doesn't require a psychotherapist, doesn't require like all of this stuff. Maybe, maybe that does exist hypothetically. When people ask me who's the greatest psychotherapist, I say it's probably some person's grandmother and she makes the best like chicken noodle soup that you can imagine. And when you taste it, you kind of feel that all of your suffering, all of your problems are gone. And so I think that the best psychotherapist is the client in a strange, strange way is that uh, it's not so much that we need to focus on idol worship or worshiping of statues. Uh, the potential for healing is is lies within the client so I'll, of course it is true is that there is a focus on um, the people who originated psychotherapy as a practice and as a study uh, who added some legitimacy to the science of psychotherapy and that can't be discounted because science must continue to evolve upon itself so that that does serve a purpose but we can't be limited by it there, like mindfulness has been around for centuries, but it was only <laughs> rediscovered by the West in like the 80s, 90s or something. So it's like, it's it's really to say that there might be even something even more sophisticated that was done in the past that we might be able to tap into. But ultimately, I think that the best therapist, as I said, is the client. And I'll also say that um, a deep belief in spirituality uh, also is something that uh, is like a basic, basic foundation uh, to help people. And spirituality doesn't need to mean religion, but it's it's important to uh, you know to to give thanks for the the sacrifices that our that our ancestors made so that we could be here. Yeah, definitely got to give a salute to the ancestors. I'm definitely a big fan of. Uh honoring our ancestors, including those ancestors that have recently moved on. I think about people like John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, definitely a number of others even here in Durham where I'm at, uh, Chuck Davis, who is a uh, leader in the African dance kind of community and everything was a kind of great person that I definitely uh, feel is watching it over us. And the same with Skippy Scarborough, who was a historian here in this area. So definitely I do think that we have to have connection to our ancestors as to well to, to those that have uh, carried on the path ahead of us. And we were actually earlier talking about two of the great legends, that being, of course, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and all of that. Um, one of the things I was curious about, Dr. Archer, was you the kind oh, of child. I'm not a doctor. 
It's just okay. a master's of social work, master's of couple and family therapy. I'll get sued if you call me a doctor, so I gotta I gotta make sure I don't get sued. I gotta keep my uh, pennies in my wallet. Yeah, we wanna yes, keep your ahead. pennies in your we keep your pennies in your pockets for sure. So <laughs> Mr. Archer and everything. Um, were you the one that as a kid was always the one that was kind of doing uh trying to help people as a youth? Because I do know that a lot of times we as people of a friend of mine calls us uh Folks of the light, of uh, some people call folks empath, empaths and things of that nature. So were you the one that as a kid was always empathetic or was just something that developed in terms of your interest later in life? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, it's because I think that everyone comes to the path of therapy for different reasons. Right. There's never just uh, one reason. But when you're talking about me being a kid, I'm like, no, I was the type of kid who liked to play video games. I mean, I still am. I still have to feed into my inner child, play a video game here and there for my own self-care. But, but um, it's it's really to say that, like, um, I think that as a young child, um, it, it's like, because what happens is that with blackness, what takes place is that you don't see yourself as black. It's that white people make you black. And I, I was just reflecting on that even this morning of that uh, the creation of when black people took place was at the, the same exact time that white people, that the creation of white people took place, that they could, because you needed to create all of them because they, they, they're just social construction. So you needed to say what's good at the same time that you say what's evil. You needed to develop the lie at the same time for both people. So when I was young, um, when I was younger, uh, I just noticed that there was oftentimes like a stress between because I'm in the uh, province of Quebec. So it's like there was a stress between who's English, who's French, who's white, who's black, who's native, who's not native. So there was always this identity thing going on, but there was oftentimes a suppression of it. And there was a town that I that I lived in called uh, Chattagui. And. Um, I remember being younger and seeing that there was like an effigy that was being burnt at the entrance to the town that they, they made a doll that was supposed to represent a native person and they burnt it in at the entrance. And we had tanks and all that stuff going on because this is Oka crisis. This was a, uh, another political thing. You may be aware of it. As you said, you had some, some knowledge of people in Canada the native community 1990 that was a real big thing we thought that war was going to pop off in in our town but it's just that from from a young age i was given the label of black and when you're given the label of black you try to either live up to it or you try to counter it and mm -hmm. i started to to realize that i actually love the color of black and some color of my shirt <laughs> like you know it's my favorite it's actually <laughs> yeah it's, it's actually the color of my car and all that stuff but i love the color black and i i realized that it just didn't seem right i was like wait why is it that that i'm treated differently because i'm black and when you're younger and when you're when you're a black man you're often told that being black means either sports or entertainment that right. being black involves just the use of your body never the use of your mind and I was told, uh, you know, you get the same type of thing. Like you're, you're sent to detention more frequently because you're a black youth. Uh, I think there was a time last year in the States that there was uh, a young black girl who was sent to jail because she didn't do her homework. So it's like those things actually the research supports and says that black people get higher consequences from in school and all that stuff. But it's like those things, they, they didn't discourage me of making it so that I resented my blackness and made it so that I dived a bit deeper into trying to say, well, no, this is what black means to me. This is what I'd like to be. And I was very interested in the idea that depending on how we speak or depending on the words, that there's a resonance that takes place. I was really interested in music, in hip hop. And how like there's words that we can string together and it like builds a vibe, like a person feels a certain vibe when when it's on the beat. And so if it wasn't for hip hop, if it wasn't for being an artist first, I never would have become a therapist. I knew I knew that when when you're doing hip hop music, it's like you can make a person feel you feel because 
as a performer, it's like when you're when you're feeling the music, there's something that's better than any type of drug, any type of experience. When you're performing and you're synced up with the beat and you're synced up with the crowd, there's a euphoric feeling that takes place. And I realize that if my words can do that, and if I can help certain people, you know, to you know to get live and feel good, then would it also be possible for me to to help people to recover and to become strong? And from psychotherapy, I've seen that. I've seen it happen countless times. That you get a person who, at the end of the work, that they're able to say, you know, I'm glad to say that I'm a proud Indian, or you know. Like, I'm glad to say that I'm a proud black woman. Like, these are beautiful, beautiful things. These are things like the type of work that I do. It doesn't get covered in the media because it's all confidential and no one knows about it. But it's these little victories. When you see a person recover from depression, see them recover from anxiety and from the anxiousness, from racial trauma, it's these things that motivate my calling. So when I think of the Martin Luther King, when I think of the Malcolm X, the Huey Newtons, everyone who came before us, C.T. Vivians, you were mentioning some legends yes. before, I, I needed to include him too. But it's just that I just think of their calling. I just think of like, what is that energy that pushes them forward? And I, I primarily think that a lot of it has to do with, uh, with the ancestors. Is that for every person listening to this broadcast, including you and including me, is that there may have been one of our ancestors in the past who might have did everything that they could to make sure that we that their child survived they might have did everything they could to maybe hide us from someone to like maybe feed us like like whatever food they could find just so that we would have a great grandparent that great grandparent might have done everything that they could it might have struggled might have fought so that we could survive survived in some way or another and so when we think about who came before us we have to express a sense of gratitude, of knowing that what we're going through right now may be challenging, but to remember that patterns repeat themselves and to remember that every single person listening to this, that there was someone who fought for you, for you to be here today. So we have to express a gratitude and a connection to the past. And um, that's what kind of keeps me going. Yeah. I had my parents, my mother was was my biggest fan when I was, when I was younger. And she didn't want anybody to to tell me that being black meant this. She knew that, like, you know, coming from Jamaica, she already had a black identity. Living in Canada, I had a, a black identity that was defined by white people. So having that type of people who, who were strong in their identity, playing reggae music all night, all, you know, <laughs> anyways, it's just to say that these are the things, like if you're having like a strong, like identity and group and, and like understanding of your own innate value, if you're realizing where you came from, seeing the value and the importance of maintaining that pattern of, of like keeping life going, of not giving up and finding a way to survive, then we're able to leave a legacy for, for the next generation, which that should be our main priority. Yeah, definitely. And as you were talking, you were making me think of a lot of different questions and everything, which is oftentimes what happens on these kind of interviews. It's just why I love these kind of interviews. Sure, and, everything. and one of the things that I was thinking about was uh, you were talking about uh, some of your work uh, and some of the things you've done in the past, even on the native reservations. And I know that a lot of time addictions and gambling issues can impact our societies in those communities. I've actually got a cousin that is, um, recovered, but she was definitely her and her husband were addicted to meth and all of that. So I was just mm -hmm. wondering if you could talk a little bit about sure. your work in that field as well, because I do know that that has impacted a number of our minority communities, but particularly our, um, Native American Native brothers and sisters. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Gabor Mate. He's like kind of, uh, he's an awesome, uh, I guess, like a thought leader on addiction. And he was the one who told, who taught me, like I went to one of his uh, many like trainings or workshops or something. And it's like, cause I was trying to understand why is it that the native community gets hit by addiction like this? And like, why is it that even black people get hit by addiction and get hit by these things? And it's like he explained that there is like a link between trauma and substance abuse. Mm. And I found in my practice, whether in the native community, whether in my own private practice, I have never met 
a person who had a substance abuse issue who didn't also have trauma. So I've never met someone who was uh, self-medicating, because that's what it is. When you're right. using a drug, you're, you're kind of filling your own prescription. So I've never met someone who's self-medicated and didn't have pain. And the interesting thing about um, the native uh, population is that um, you could not, I believe, you can't successfully treat the addiction without understanding or at least acknowledging the uh, the function of addiction that took place in their community. Because it's not just an individual thing. This is, alcohol was introduced into native populations intentionally. Right. Um, there are many treaties that were broken. Many of the, like, there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of literature on, on all that stuff. But it's really to say that what necess like what, what helps a person to overcome their addiction is also a sense of pride in who they are. And in, and you need to have something that's uh, a higher, you know, we would call it like a, a higher power. It doesn't need to be a religion, mm -hmm. but even the higher power of saying like for my family, like your family is a, is greater than you. It's more people and it's a community like for my community and all that. So it's really to say that when we talk about the addiction rates that are that are in the native community, we also have to talk about what put them in the community in the first place. <laughs> what is it that put, that made reserve? <laughs> what what structure created that? And that helps us to be able to, to start to think outside of the box. But realistically, when we do talk about anti-racism, I don't think that all of our problems could be solved by just attending a course or attending like a, like one of my sessions or something like that. We need real and significant structural change. We need you know, we need to to change the patterns that that create the uh, the environment for terrible things to flourish. Like you know, yeah, it's interesting you say that because I know one of the things that they talk about here on IBM TV and the founders, actually one of the founders, Kim Calhoun, as well as Nick Palvedo, oftentimes talk about it, is that they feel that we are in the middle of a uh, educational crisis to some degree because they feel that we are using 18th century tools in the 21st <laughs> century and yes. they definitely feel that we need to get more into a 21st century mindset so For it sounds real. like me like based on that reaction that you would agree with them and I was just wondering if you could maybe address some conversations to them as I'm sure they're listening to everything as to whether you feel that is the case even in psychotherapy and in the field of medicine but it does seem like we are definitely uh, not addressing the 20 first century we're stuck in the 18th or the 17th century i would even argue mm -hmm. and i think that um it's just that we're very invested in being able to to keep a narrative that is very comfortable for us unfortunately we feel very comfortable telling people that santa claus is real in our countries in many different metaphors and many ways of interpreting that but I think that there needs to come a time in our nations and in our in, in who we are where we come to terms with the fact that um, that not only is it that our fairy tales uh, have served a purpose, maybe at a specific time in our in our development, but that we start to write our own story, that we stop just telling stories just because it's convenient. That we start to really think about what is most effective the the approach that i use is the one that's most effective for me the way how i talk and the way and who i am this this comes out of my own suffering and i think that if we're able to sit with suffering instead of trying to nurse it um it, instead of trying to find a pain relief a quick pain relief like from one shiny thing to another if we're able to really like there's a friend of mine is in the military he said uh you know, when you put a soldier through fire, then you find out what he's made out of. And I, I really, like, I take that to heart. And I really think that is from my own suffering that I was able to develop my own wisdom. And that's that's what I think is part of this goal of, of psychotherapy, as I said at the beginning, is that, yes, there may be things in the past that, have, uh, that could be helpful as a guide. And there are patterns that have been observed in the past, but we must come to terms understanding that each of us is is truly precious there's not just one way of solving this this thing there's many different paths but each of us is precious and i think if we can sit with that long enough we can
can find the wisdom that we need to to make the changes that are necessary. Yeah, I don't think. Sense. Yeah, I really don't think that our problems are difficult. It's just that because we're holding on to statues and thinking mm -hmm. statues should not be torn down, this is what's making we're we're holding on to a past that was uh, that never was. <laughs> so this is this is what's happening. So for my clients, I tell them that we we learn from the past, but we got to let it go at some point. We reprocess the past, we look at it differently, and then we use our current, present, everyday selves to be able to look back at the past, learn the positive lesson that's that's from there, to stop believing in the negative, dysfunctional belief, and to choose an adaptive belief that more resonates with you and that can help to guide you in the future. And how do you get folks away from that whole baggage concept? Because you were talking about, and it sounds to me like you're trying to encourage people to leave the baggage at the door, to use that old expression. But I know mm -hmm. that even in relationships and even in work environments, a lot of times folks have a hard time doing that. They have a hard time leaving the baggage of past jobs, past relationships, past whatever, away from their current situations. And I've even... Um, alluded to that even in the job hunt kind of environment or in the environment of mm -hmm. trying to get gigs and things of that nature because I know that sometimes we actually and I've used this analogy before we fire ourselves before we can be fired meaning that True. we've already given up on the job before we've even gone for the job and all of that and definitely the same with relationships where we bring in those packs baggages into new relationships and that of course is detrimental in and of its own self so I just wonder some of the tools that you try to give to your clients to get them away from those two examples, and that's just two examples. I'm sure I could come up with hundreds more that I know that are common that a lot of folks do, which is the one, either find yourself from your job or before going for the job or two, leaving, bringing too much baggage into relationships. For real. Well, for, for that, I'd say um, it's a better idea for that. Like I tell people that uh, let them say no before you say no. And so, you know, it's like there's so many times how we talk ourselves out of opportunities just because of uh, like past patterns that are not necessarily real. The way how I help people is I help them to know that some of those past patterns are traumas that are unresolved. And through the use of EMDR, through the use of bilateral stimulation, there's like things that involve the body and the movements of the body. Because many of our pains, when we think of our emotions, we don't really think about it. But uh, the emotion has like a physical correlate. There's like something that happens when you're embarrassed, you feel it at the bottom of the stomach. When you're angry or heartbroken is the best example. You feel it in the place where you think the heart would be. When there's a lot on your mind, you feel it on the head. So the way how I help people is by being able to communicate more with their body, to be able to, to listen to the body so that when it's, when it's whispering, we acknowledge it. Because if we don't acknowledge it, it starts to talk, then it starts to yell at us. So this is why we want to have a better relationship with ourselves, with our bodies. We want to make it so that when we think about things in the past, that we can still feel clear, that we're not feeling as hurt and, and in so much pain. And in a strange way, when our body is able to feel a bit more clear, then we become a bit more clear on our objectives of what needs to take place. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know one of the other things that I know that uh, Kim, who's one of the other founders of the network, talks about, and it seems to be another field that you've worked in and everything, and that's the whole concept of domestic violence, because he is a woman, and I know that that's a, the issue dear to her heart and everything along that line. So I was just wondering if you could talk about that, because I do know that there was a fear that we were going to see more of a rise of that during COVID because more people were at home together, which can lead to definitely some good uh, reactions to couples being in, combined together, but it can also lead to some negative reactions if there was already that tension that existed and now you've got to be with that person all the time. So mm -hmm. I just wondering some of your thoughts about your work in that domestic violence field. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, it's just to say that um, it's likely that there's been a rise and an increase of this because it's just the problem is that um, there's not really any coverage of it. And it's because there's likely that there's a lot of mental health issues that are out there, um, but there's such a big taboo about talking about these things. And domestic violence itself, too, is a mental health issue. Uh, not only for the survivor of the violence, but the offender as well. Because, as I say, um, there's a bit of research that says that if you're young and if you're a boy, and if you witness your father being violent towards your mother, 
it increases the chance that you might seek out a partner that you could be violent towards. Mm -hmm. And that same level of research, it explains that if you are the daughter, and if you witness that your mother is being harmed physically by your father, then you may seek out a relationship that makes it so that you are also harmed by your partner. So it's so important for us to know that if we're looking at domestic violence or any type of mental health issue uh, as isolated from the social or from the family context from which, from which it originates, then we're only getting half the story. We're not necessarily treating domestic violence if we can't talk about patriarchy. We're not like helping domestic violence if we can't talk about relationships. This right. stuff, all, it all comes down to the same thing, is that we gotta really take a good look at what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what does it mean to be in a good relationship? What does it mean to be a good person? And uh, these are brave questions. These are brave discussions. And if you're talking about these people, if they'd like to have me on the show, I'd, I'd, I'd also like to have a, I'll discuss with them. But yes. it's to say that, that um, uh, we need to really think about our society that we're a part of. Uh, we also need to come from that family systems perspective of just knowing that we're all brothers and sisters. Our, our original ancestors were just from Africa. And when we can like let go of some of these statues and start to recognize that we are all related, that we're all interrelated in some way, shape, or form, then we can approximate and come a bit closer to the truth, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I know that some of your other work, in addition to the anti-racism and the work around what you call intersectional feminists, is being queer and trans friendly in your work as well. So I'd love to hear you talk about what that means to you being intersectional feminist as a man and what it also means to you to be queer and trans trans friendly as well. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a similar thing as that. Uh, for me, I'm a, I'm a heterosexual man. And with that comes privilege. Because uh, I was explaining to someone else that what privilege is, is that uh, privilege is really just the absence of mindfulness. Mm. So, like, privilege means that you don't have to think. It's like kind of like if you're rich, you don't have to think about buying some. Like, you could just spend whatever you want. Like, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're, like, a man, then, you know, you could, like, go out to a club by yourself like at night and you know there of course there's a risk of like crime depending on where you're at but it's nothing like the risk that a woman has uh a woman may likely if she's going to a club may bring a friend because there's going to be a whole bunch of guys that are likely to treat talk to her differently um so as a man i don't have to be as mindful of my gender um a similar thing as a heterosexual is that I don't have to come out. <laughs> like, I already came out. Like, you know, it's like, you, 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 no, you don't even really, as a heterosexual, you don't even really need to come out. Right. It's like people, people just assume that this is who you are. But it becomes more challenging if you're uh, part of the queer community where you have to think, okay, if I'm honest about who I am, I might lose family members, I might lose friends, I might lose my job. Um, and also just with a woman as well is that there's cases where if the woman becomes pregnant, she may not have, I think in you guys' country, your maternity leave is not really that long. So there's a chance that you can lose your job because you got pregnant. So because you're doing a normal, biologic, regular thing, um, you can lose your job. This is what mean. This is what I mean about it. It just being like it's an extra difficulty level, depending on the various intersections that a person has. So being uh, a black man uh, is a bit more difficult from being a white man, because blackness is perceived as undesirable in our society. Being a black woman is a bit more difficult from being a black man, because being a woman is seen as like less capable in certain ways, even if feminism has advanced, women are still being paid a bit less. Good. And then being a black trans woman and so on and so on, is that you also have to deal with the fact that people believe that you don't deserve the same human rights. 
last year was I think uh, there was an activist named Peppermint who's uh, was on uh, the Cornell West uh, uh, podcast, and uh, I think that she was saying that last year was the highest amount of black. Uh, I, th I think it was the highest amount of like trans women who were killed in the United States, like on record. And so it's it's just to say that um, these different identities that we do have for people to tell me that that they don't see race is ridiculous because these people they will never say that they don't see gender right and so no one has ever said that to me ever they've told me many times that hey some of my friends are black but they've said all these other uh uh, uh bs terms it's a clinical term mm -hmm. but it's it's just to say that um uh we haven't really reckoned with with race uh so we we haven't really reckoned with gender it looked like we did but no there still are higher rates of femicides higher rates of black women who give birth that they die during like there there's all of these things that are taking place so it's just to say that this is why i fight for anti-racism this is why i advance it is because it's related to all the other forms of discrimination Right. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And you're right. That it's amazing that in 2021, you still have people that will use that uh, concept of they've got a uh, a black friend or a Latin friend or that they've uh, dated a uh, black man or a uh, black woman or something along those lines as a means to justify their own existence in a multiracial society not necessarily kind of like say it as a way that they love that person or cared about that person but as a tool in part of their own identity and everything of that nature and i've heard people say that on a number of occasions where they'll tell you that they've For got sure. this black friend or that black friend or that they've mm -hmm. been out on a date with this black person or that black person, or in some cases, they might even tell you that they've married or been married to somebody of a different race or ethnicity, where that's not really the concept of the conversation that you were having with them in the first place. But they just wanted to like use this as a tool to kind of justify themselves as being legitimately caring about you as a minority person. Yeah, so that's kind of how it is. But look, yeah. I think that everyone is is like trying the best that they can there's like a higher like level of racial consciousness now. So I think that now is not the time for us to backpedal. No, now I is agree. The time for us, like white people, that's good. White people are leveling up. They're starting to realize, yo, racism is bad. And I get that. That's great. There's a lot of like abolitionists who have been around, like, um, you know, have been trying to, to, to wake people up a long, long time in the country. So some people are starting to wake up, but it's also for black people too. Is that uh, you? Get, what you guys did in uh, in Georgia was a beautiful. But I thought that was a beautiful thing. Oh yeah, I totally agree. That was a wonderful thing what they did in Georgia and everything. One of the other shows that we've got here is a show called Gamers Den, um, and I'll definitely have to have to Toby come. You come on that show as I know you're a big video game fan and everything. But part of what the conversation is, and I actually co-host that with him on every Thursday, is the whole concept of how a lot of people use video games as a negative aspect of how they are hurting us in terms of hurting our youth and everything. And they want to talk about the violence. They want to talk about some of the stereotypes that exist within certain video games and things along that nature. So I was just wondering your thoughts. And like I said, I'll probably have you come to Toby's show as well. Yeah, but man. Man, have me, yeah. Have me on the show, man. Have me on the show. Cause I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to head out soon, but. Right. Uh, have me on the show i'd like to i'd like to discuss it just to talk about it in length because uh i think again like we're talking and there's there's a lot there's there's a whole lot that's there but i think the primacy of it is uh is race i think that that and that's that's just because i've seen how race affects so many people but i'd love to talk about video games i'm, I'm of course i'm definitely a big fan and i'd love to but i want to make sure i have my full like the full time to talk about video games that's definitely one of my passions Cool. Well, like I said, the show is one to three on Thursday, so I might even send you an invitation for this Thursday, if not this Thursday, next Thursday and everything, but I'll definitely send you the StreamYard link and hopefully you can join us in that conversation. We oftentimes have other folks that come in, and of course, we even play video games during the show, but actually he does more That's than awesome. playing. We actually just talk about what game he's playing and everything, but definitely I was just kind of curious as to if you had a synopsis view or a quick view as to when folks give you that but we'll give you more 
detail time on that particular show and everything. But when For folks sure. talk about the violent aspect of video games, what is your reaction to that as well as the way that it is a um, a negative tool? Because sometimes people think, think of another addiction that people may have. Mm-hmm. Well, again, is that um, I think it's a big, that's a big question, man. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm saying is that that's a big question. I'd like to pick it apart. But the key thing is that like, um, I think we always have to think about the reason why we're doing certain things. And um, it's, it's that there are some ways that people will like, there's things that are real, like, um, like internet addiction, like these things are real things and they are really damaging to people's families and all that. But uh, we got to address it on a case by case basis. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not, it's not that everyone who is playing the video game is like an addict. It's not that everyone who's playing the video game is violent. Um, but it's that we got to find out what is it in our society that creates this violence it comes down to the same thing. Like, you know, is that, uh, we can blame the individual, but we also got to take a look at the family that the individual came from. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. I also wanted to get to a little bit. I know you said you might have to bounce in another 15 minutes yeah, or so. I got, I got to head out just now, actually. I thought okay. it was only one hour. No, no problem. And like yeah. I said, uh, but definitely I appreciate your time and everything. I'm glad to know about the hip hop music as well. And one of the things that I always give my guests an opportunity to do as we wrap up this particular uh, segment and everything is I always yeah. give them a chance to give their words of encouragement, their words of positivity. If you mm-hmm. want to talk about your hip hop music, then you can do that as well during this time. But one of the things that I always encourage people to do on all my shows is to give their words of positivity, their words of encouragement that they would like to share with our global audience so like i said i know you've got to get ready to bounce but definitely i've appreciated your conversation and if you also want to share a little bit about the book that you've got coming out as well this is your time to do that as well but um whatever you can give me to wrap it up then i can go from there and show, share a little bit about some of the other shows we've got on the network and that'll give a great conversation and i've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you mr archer because you've Thank definitely you, brought some great knowledge into what folks needed to learn Thank you, Mark. I, I appreciate it. And thank you again for giving me the, the space uh, to talk. Um, I think, well, first I'll just talk a bit about how, um, and I've mentioned it before, is really to say that everyone who's listening to this broadcast, uh, just to know that um, that you had ancestors who fought for you. You know, everyone who's listening, I've met some people sometimes who would say that that they feel uh, bad about themselves or about their self-worth. And it's just for us to know that um, that we're all on a journey. And even if we're on a journey and sometimes we might make a misstep or step in the wrong direction, it still means we can return back to the path. I feel that everyone's life is, is worth it. And anyone listening to this, just to know that you're worth it. That there was someone in the past, maybe maybe it seems a bit difficult in your current life, but remember that in the past, there's somebody who helped to make it so that you would be here today. And so when we're wondering about what our purpose is, what our meaning is, a lot of it is just to keep going, to make it so that our ancestor sacrifice was not in vain. And the book that I'm coming out with, it is a book about psychotherapy. It's uh, called Anti-Racist Psychotherapy, Confronting Systemic Racism and Healing Racial Trauma. Uh, a lot of what we spoke about today by uh, the, the gracious uh, time that you provided with me, Mark, I appreciate that. A lot of what's in the book is about race issues, uh, mindfulness, and also this dichotomy between what's called white supremacy and black mm-hmm. suffering and mm-hmm. trying to locate a way of moving forward uh, using psychotherapy, specifically using EMDR psychotherapy, brain spotting psychotherapy, uh, emotional freedom techniques, and just trying to help people to know that regardless of these social labels that other people have given you, just know that the labels, they serve a purpose for someone else, perhaps, but it's so important for us to redefine the label that we want to live by. It's so important for us to redefine what is our calling, our true calling. And it may not be, 
it doesn't need to be the same calling that I have. It doesn't need to be the same calling that Martin Luther King or, or that any of the other people had. But as long as we just make a decision that we're going to live like through principles, like, you know, that we're going to do our best to re-educate ourselves, to decolonize ourselves, find ways of being more compassionate to one another, but be willing to defend and to empower others. And I think that it's, it's a life worth living. And it, it doesn't need to be on the biggest scale. Like sometimes it's really the simplest things that have the biggest impact. And before you know it, if you just keep on the path, uh, one step at a time, you'll end up getting to like the destination that you're meant to be. And yeah, that's pretty much it. No, I appreciate you. You definitely gave a lot of insight and a lot of powerful thoughts that I know a lot of folks will need to be hearing and all of that. And like I said, I definitely will be inviting you back to a couple of the shows that we've got going on and all of that. So definitely I was glad to share you with a little bit of everybody and for folks to learn a little bit more of what you've got going on. If you want to just share a little bit about your musical background before you walk out the door, I'm sure folks would like to know that as well, because I did see that you were a hip hop artist in addition to being a therapist. So I'd like yes. to know if folks can know where they can hear your hip hop words and a little bit about your hip hop music, and then I'll let you walk out the door as well. <laughs> Mark, so again, is that I, I gotta head out, but uh, next time we'll talk a bit more about that. So I'm gonna gonna have to leave you leave you guys with a cliffhanger. But I will say, the book antiracistpsychotherapy dot com. Go right. on that website, and you're going to be able to find out more about that. And then next time, Mark is going to come and spit some freestyles for us. And we're going <laughs> to... No, you're going to spit the freestyles. I'm not spitting any freestyles. I'm going to leave that to you. But I know you can do it, and you can do it well. So I'm going to leave the pros to spit the freestyles. You know, I've got some friends I might bring on the show to share right. the freestyles spit with bars, you. Man. Yeah, man. All right. So, <laughs> so that's, what's go- that's what's up. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Antiracistpsychotherapy.com. And just trying to, yeah, man, just trying to, to find ways of inspiring other black people uh, to, to get into the field, trying to get more people to, to know that our mental health must be a priority and that we can build it if we, if we put our minds together and our hearts. Definitely. Well, you've been a great guest. I definitely appreciate you being on. And while you're getting ready to get out that door, I'm going to put on some spots of some of our other shows, including the show that my friend, uh, brother Mike does from Nigeria on Fridays, which is, uh, he does a show out of Nigeria called Mind Closet. So we're going to let folks check out a little bit about what that's all about because he oftentimes talks about the spiritual connection and a number of other things that he's got going on. And they've even talking about some hard issues because even in Nigeria, they've been dealing with police violence and things of that nature. So he's actually right, had some yeah. guests talking about that on his show. So this is a little bit about Mind Closet. <laughs> to that we've also got podcast this thursday so let me check you know, check that one out as well As Mr. Archer walks out the door and everything, we're going to give you all a little dose of uh, the speech from Dr. King, because definitely that's one of the things we can do here is we can always bring up some of the great speeches of some of our legends and all of that. So I'm going to bring up one of Dr. King's speeches and might give you all a little bit of taste of what he's all got going on and some of the legacy of Dr. King. But we're going to bring up the one from I Have a Dream and all of that. So that being said, we're going to give you at least a little clip of the I Have a Dream speech. A leader and a hero. Do you recognize this man? People all over the world know his face. 
They know his name. Now you will too. This is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and he was an American hero. Dr. King was born in Atlanta, Georgia, on January 15, 1929. That was more than 90 years ago. Here's a picture of Martin when he was six years old. He loved riding his bike, playing baseball, and eating ice cream. Martin's best friend was a boy who lived nearby, but that changed one day when his friend told him they couldn't play together anymore. His friend was white, and Martin was black. His friend's father didn't want his son playing with a black child. This made Martin sad and angry. He didn't understand why he couldn't play with his friend. During that time, there were laws in parts of our country that kept white people and black people apart. Keeping people apart like this is called segregation. The law said that black people and white people had to go to different schools, parks, and restaurants. The schools and parks for black people were often old and run down. The schools and parks for white people had newer books and better playgrounds. Just a little bit of the history of segregation and all of that. But now we're going to bring up that speech from Dr. King as well. So if y'all hold on one second, we're going to bring up that speech from Dr. King. And uh, I think y'all will enjoy this. And that should take us all the way almost up till the three o'clock hour. But I may give you some of the other excerpts from his speech as well. So get ready to bring up Dr. King's speech because we do know that this is um, definitely a day to honor Dr. King and all of that. So definitely, if y'all hold on, we're going to bring up the uh, speech right here, uh, excerpt from the I Have a Dream speech. Martin Luther King, they I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, A great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, The life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners 
Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. One day right now in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discourse of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring and we can come When we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Yes, that was the powers of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And, of course, we are here on uh, January 18th, which, of course, is uh, the day that we are honoring the legacy of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and all of that. So definitely uh, some great conversations and all of that that folks will get a chance to learn and all of that. So definitely along those same lines, we're going to let you hear a little excerpt from uh, Dr. King and a speech that he had with um, things uh 
in terms of our news folks and all of that. So Dr. Martin King definitely had some great conversations with great media folks and all of that. And I definitely found a, a clip of one of those that I think folks will find interesting from the archives of the media and all of that. So I'm going to let y'all hear just a little bit of the words of Dr. King in Dr. King's own words from one of our fine folks over there in the network land and all of that. So we're going to hear a little bit of a Dr. King from a uh, thing that he did with one of the uh, networks back in the 60s and all of that. So let's hear a little bit of his words here in his own words. Brooks inviting you to meet the press. Meet the press, America's press conference of the air and winner of every major award in its field is a public affairs presentation of NBC News. Our guest today on Meet the Press is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who led the Civil Rights March from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Dr. King, who was the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, is president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He is in San Francisco, where he delivered a sermon this morning for Bishop Pike at the Grace Cathedral. Our panel of reporters is in Washington, D.C., and we'll have the first question now from Lawrence E. Spivak, permanent member of the Meet the Press panel. Uh, Dr. King, uh, former President Truman, was quoted by the AP as saying that the march from Selma, and the, this was his word, was silly and can't accomplish a darn thing except to attract attention. Now, there have been two murders, many beatings, and a federal expenditure for troops of about $300,000. Would you say that what the march accomplished was worth that cost? Well, first, I would say that the march was not silly at all. Uh, I would think that uh, the march did more to dramatize the indignities and the injustices that Negro people continue to face in the state of Alabama and many other sections of the South uh, more than anything else. I think it was the most powerful and dramatic civil rights protest that has ever taken place in the South. South. And I think it well justified the cost that we put in it. Now, of course, we are sorry that uh, a death occurred uh, immediately after the march. And I'm sure that all people of goodwill are outraged and uh, in deep sorrow as a result of the death of Mrs. Luzo. But uh, after all, we know in a nonviolent movement that there are these uh, possibilities and we go on with the faith that unmerited suffering is redemptive. Dr. King, I think the demonstration was largely to get your voting rights bill through. Was it necessary for that purpose? Aren't you going to get that bill? And wouldn't you have gotten it whether or not you marched? Well, the demonstration was uh, certainly for the voting rights bill. However, we must recognize that there are other very tragic conditions existing in the state of Alabama, which are as humiliating, as degrading, and as uh, unjust as the denial of the right to vote, uh, namely police brutality. And we marched on the state of uh, the capital of Alabama to protest the long night of brutality the constant murders that continue to take place in that state, for after all, under the administration of Governor Wallace, uh, there have been 10 persons actually killed and murdered, and nothing has been done about it. Uh, there have been untold bombings of homes and churches. Again, nothing has been done about this on the whole, and we were marching there to protest these uh, brutalities, these uh, murders, and all of the things that go along with them as much as to gain the right to vote. So it was a two-fold march aimed at trying to rectify the conditions of Alabama and expose the evils that are deeply engulfed in that state. Well, Dr. King, you had your great demonstration, and Governor Leroy Collins, head of the Community Relations Service, hoped there would be a respite from demonstrations in Alabama in order to give the state an opportunity to solve some of the problems. Do you think there should be a respite in Alabama now? Well, here again, with the murder of Mrs. Leuzo on uh, the eve of uh, the night uh, after the march, 
Uh, I can't see how there can be a respite. Uh, this is a state that continues to deal with human life as it is uh, nothing. This is a state that continues to make uh, murder a sort of uh, nice pastime and gives respectability to resistance and defiance of the law. Uh, this is a state that continues to do all of the things that are contrary uh, to our democratic creed, at least the political power structure of the state. And in the light of this, it seems to me that it will be necessary to continue to demonstrate until these conditions are removed. We don't believe in demonstrating for demonstration's sake. We don't have demonstration fever. But we do feel that as long as the conditions of injustice and man's inhumanity to man infiltrate that state, it will be necessary to demonstrate in order to bring these issues to the surface and lay them square before the conscience of the nation. Then, as I understand it, Dr. King, you see no end to demonstrations at the present, either in Alabama or in other sections of the country? Uh, no, I don't. I don't believe in the indiscriminate use of demonstrations. But I think as long as we have the problems with us, we're going to have demonstrations. And I think in the immediate, we must face the fact that Alabama has not come to terms with its conscience. Uh, too many people of goodwill, and I do feel that there are many white people of goodwill and very decent white people in Alabama, but they have uh, abdicated responsibility to the governor and to the sheriff clerks and to the Bull Connors. And for this reason, we feel that we have a moral obligation to keep these issues before the public, before the American conscience, before the mainstream of our nation so that somebody will do something about it. And demonstrations have proved to be the best way to do this. Dr. King, would you list for us the barriers remaining which you believe must be destroyed before you and uh, your followers will stop these demonstrations and give the South the chance to catch up? Yes, uh, first, uh, there must be uh, an agreement on the part of the political power structure of the South to guarantee the unhampered right to vote. Uh, this must be done with uh, zeal, and it must be done with good faith. And this means removing every obstacle, including the poll tax. Now, there are some states uh, in the hardcore South and other sections of the South that still have uh, the poll tax uh, in state elections, and we feel that this must be removed. Uh, secondly, we confront the problem of brutality from sheriffs and from uh, other police uh, forces, from other law enforcement agents. And we feel that before demonstrations can cease, something must be done to end this kind of unnecessary uh, abuse of police power and what we see as outright police brutality. Uh, third, I would like to say that if our demonstrations are to stop, there must be some equality in terms of grappling with the problem of poverty. Uh, we have a poverty bill which has been nobly initiated by the president of our nation and the Congress, but in the South so often, uh, Negroes are denied the opportunity to be a part of these programs. They are not denied the possibility uh, the opportunity to be a part of the administration of them. And we feel that if demonstrations are to stop, uh, Negroes must be brought into the very central structure of the whole poverty program. And then along with that, I think uh, that is a great necessity to get every local governmental agency to go on record in line with law and order. All of these things are necessary before we can call a halt to demonstration. We'll be back with Meet the Press and more questions for our guest, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. First, this message. Now, back to Meet the Press. Please remember, questions of our panel do not necessarily reflect their own point of view. Here is your moderator, Ned Brooks.
Resuming our interview, our guest today on Meet the Press is Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who is in San Francisco. On our panel of reporters in Washington, G.C., you have just met Lawrence Spivak. Our other reporters today are Tom Wickert of the New York Times, James J. Kilpatrick of the Richmond News Leader, and John Chancellor of NBC News. We'll continue the questions now with Mr. Wicker. Uh, Dr. King, you said that Alabama was a state that uh, gives respectability to the resistance and defiance of the law, and you listed uh, uh, an observance of the law by local agencies in the South as one of the cardinal aims that you were seeking. Uh, yet on March the 9th, you led the second march on Montgomery in uh, violation of a federal injunction not to march. You said that order was unjust, and John Lewis, one of your colleagues, said that the Negroes had a constitutional right to march injunction or no injunction. Now, was that in keeping with the spirit of nonviolence and the restraint that has always characterized your movement, and could you explain your reasoning in defying the court order that day? Well, let me say two things to that, Mr. Wicker. First, uh, I did not consider myself defying a court order that particular day. I consulted with my attorneys before the march, and they stated that uh, they felt that it was an invalid order and that uh, it would not uh, be, that I would not be in contempt of court uh, violating uh, the court order if I led the march uh, to the point of having a moral confrontation with the state troopers at the point where the people were brutalized on Sunday. So I still don't consider that uh, breaking a court order or breaking what I consider an unjust law. On the other hand, I must be honest enough to say uh, that I do feel that there are two types of laws. One is a just law and one is an unjust law. I think we all have moral obligations to obey just laws. On the other hand, I think we have moral obligations to disobey unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. I think the distinction here is that when one breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust, he must do it openly, he must do it cheerfully, he must do it lovingly, he must do it civilly, not uncivilly, and he must do it with a willingness to accept the penalty. And any man who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and willingly accepts the penalty by staying in jail in order to arouse the conscience of the community on the injustice of the law is at that moment expressing the very highest respect for law. Well, I can, I can sympathize with a good deal of that, but it seems to me you get into a very difficult point here uh, at which uh, one man's conscience is, is set, in fact, above the conscience of society, which, is, which has uh, invoked the law. Uh, how are we to uh, enforce law when a doctrine is preached that, that one man's conscience may tell him that the law is unjust when other men's conscience don't tell them that. And I think you enforce it, and I think you deal with it by not allowing anarchy to develop. I do not believe in defying the law, as many of the segregationists do. I do not believe in evading the law, as many of the segregationists do. Uh, the fact is that most of the segregationists and racists that I see are not willing to suffer enough for their beliefs in segregation and... Uh, they are not willing to go to jail. I think the chief norm for guiding the situation is the willingness to accept the penalty. And I don't think any society can call an individual irresponsible who breaks the law and willingly accepts the penalty if conscience tells him that that law is unjust. And I think that uh, this is a long tradition in our society. It's a long tradition in biblical history. Uh, Melchak uh, uh, and Abednego broke an unjust law, and they did it because they had to be true to a higher moral law. Uh, the early Christians practiced civil disobedience in a superb manner. Academic freedom would not be a reality today if it had not been for Socrates and if it had not been for Socrates' willingness to practice civil disobedience. And I would say that in our own history, there's nothing that expresses uh, a massive civil disobedience any more than the Boston Tea Party, and yet we give this to our young people and our students 
as a part of the great tradition of our nation. So I think we are in good company when we break unjust laws, and I think those who are willing to do it and accept the penalty are those who are part of the saving of the nation. Mr. Kilpatrick. In drawing your distinctions between just laws and unjust laws, Dr. King, do you distinguish between statutory laws, such as a local ordinance requiring segregation, and the law that is promulgated by a court in the form of an injunction? Uh, yes, I do distinguish between these. It does depend, however, Mr. Kilpatrick, on uh, the court that uh, renders the decision, uh, and it does depend on the situation. Uh, that can be no gainsaying of the fact that many of the state courts actually misuse and abuse the judicial process. And I would make a distinction here between a decision that comes from a state court that is committed to preserving segregation and a federal court that is committed to uh, bringing the basic and underlying truths of the Constitution into being. One distinguished jurist has said, has said uh, justice too long delayed is justice denied. And we have seen courts that have delayed justice and in the process denied justice. So I would make uh, a distinction here, but I think the, the situation is... Uh, one that has to be taken under consideration. In your book, you describe the opinion of the Supreme Court in the school segregation cases as just law, if you recall. Suppose the Supreme Court were to decide in some particular case against the interests of the demonstrators, as the court very nearly decided in January in the Cox case. Uh, would you then regard such an opinion of the Supreme Court as unjust law to be disobeyed? Well, that's a rather iffy question, Mr. Kilpatrick. I would have to face it when I come to it or when we face that in our society. I happen to feel that the Supreme Court has made a decision that it will never reverse. On the other hand, I might say that one has to understand what I mean by just law. Uh, I think a law is just uh, which uh, squares with the moral law, and I think the law is unjust which is out of harmony with the moral laws of the universe. Then the uh, Supreme Court in the past has been unjust, has it not, then, in those cases in our history when it upheld segregation? Uh, I think there are laws that have come into being that uh, I considered unjust, and I think the moral conscience of the nation considered unjust. This does not mean that the persons who rendered the decision were unjust people or that they were evil people. It simply meant that at that particular time, they did not have uh, the foresight to see what, uh, let us say, back in 1896, Justin Holland saw. Uh, they differed among themselves. While most of the jurists rendered a decision making separate but equal the law of the land, there was a Justin Holland who said at that time that the Constitution is colorblind and rendered a dissenting opinion, which has now become the majority opinion of our country. Dr. King, Dr. King, we have reports from Atlanta which indicate that you will recommend to the nation's labor unions a nationwide work stoppage to keep the plight of Alabama Negroes before the country. Now, can you give us some details on this plan? Uh, yes, Mr. Chancellor. I think uh, the conditions in Alabama have degenerated to such a low level of social disruption and such a low level of man's inhumanity to man that the whole conscience of the nation must rise up and engage in uh, some kind of creative firm action program that will bring the business leaders and the decent people of Alabama to the point of bringing pressure to bear on Governor Wallace and other officials who are responsible for this reign of terror. Uh, I left Alabama last week after the March feeling that we had uh, uh, made a great triumph, and we certainly did in the March, and that maybe we would see a brighter day all over the state of Alabama. But the fact is, Governor Wallace refused to see those who had uh, a petition to present, and uh, not long after that, uh, Mrs. Luzo was uh, brutally uh, shot down in an automobile on Highway 80. Uh, this is just one other example of something that we've faced in the state of Alabama for a number of years. Consequently, I think that it is necessary
for the nation to rise up and engage in a massive economic withdrawal program on the state of Alabama, to put it another way, I think the time has come for all people of goodwill to join in an economic boycott of uh, Alabama products. So I'm in a few days planning to call on the trade unions to refuse to transport or use Alabama products. I hope to call on all Americans to refuse to buy Alabama products. And I hope to call on the Secretary of Treasury of the United States to withdraw all federal funds uh, that it has on deposit in Alabama banks. And finally, I think it is necessary to call on all federal agencies uh, in line with the 1964 Civil Rights Bill to withdraw support from a society that has refused to protect life and, and the right to vote. Mr. Spivak. Dr. King, the columnists Evans and Novak recently charged that the moderate Negro leaders, including you, have feared to point out the degree of communist infiltration in the civil rights movement. Uh, have communists infiltrated the movement? Uh, I certainly don't think so, Mr. Spivak, and I would like to vigorously uh, deny that. I have no evidence for uh, such an accusation, and I might say that in our bylaws, certainly in SCLC and uh, the NAACP and CORE and SNCC and the Urban League and all of the civil rights organizations, we make it clear that communists cannot be in official positions and cannot be in the membership. Beyond this, I think I could say that the philosophical undergirdings of our movement would uh, make communism impossible and would have communists on alien territory. For our movement has been based and is still based on a philosophy of nonviolence. Dr. And King, the, the, a yes? the AP reported the other day that a picture of you taken in 1957 at a Tennessee interracial school is being plastered all over Alabama billboards with a caption, Martin Luther King at a communist training school. Will you tell us whether that was a communist training school and what you were doing there? Well, number one, I don't think it was a communist training school. In fact, I know it wasn't. The Highlander Folk School, which was referred to in that particular article, uh, was a school that pioneered in bringing Negroes and whites together at a time when it was very unpopular to train them for leadership all over the South. And I think they did an able job in doing it. This school was supported by some of the great Americans, such as Eleanor Roosevelt, Reinhold Niebuhr, Harry Golding, and many others that I could name. Secondly, the fact is that I never attended the school uh, as far as training goes. Uh, I was there about one hour back in 1957 or 8. I went to deliver an address for the 25th anniversary of the Highlander Folk School. I got there about 15 minutes before I was to speak. I spoke about 45 minutes. And then I left immediately after my speech, and I think that's a pretty short period to get any training. Mr. Wicker. Uh, Dr. King, your movement has been uh, distinguished for its nonviolent approach, uh, but your people are under great pressures in many cases. How deeply do you fear the eruption of Negro violence in pursuit of Negro rights? I feel that uh, we will continue to have uh, a nonviolent movement, and we will continue to find the vast majority of Negroes committed to nonviolence, at least as the best tactical approach, and from a pra pragmatic point of view, as the best strategy in dealing with the problem of racial injustice. Realism impel impels me to admit, however, that when there is justice and the pursuit of justice, violence disappears, and where there is injustice and uh, frustration, the potentialities for violence are greater. And I would uh, like to strongly stress the point that the more we can achieve victories through nonviolence, the more it will be possible to keep the nonviolent discipline at the center of the movement. But the more we find individuals facing conditions of frustration, conditions of disappointment and seething despair as a result of the slow pace of things and the failure to change conditions, 
uh, the more it will be possible for the have to apostles interrupt. of sorry. violence to interfere. I'm sorry, but I see that our time is... Definitely appreciate some great comments from Dr. King and all of that. So definitely that is some memories of Dr. King and what he was all about and everything along those lines. So definitely I think you got some great insight into Dr. King and his handling of the press and uh, things along that line. So definitely um, get ready to end up the radio show with uh, Mark Lee. Definitely was glad to have um, David Archer as my guest, a psychotherapist who actually deals a lot with anti-racism, and hopefully we'll be having him back on some other shows as well. So that being said, I'm going to bring up our theme uh, show, or our theme music and everything, and wrap up this edition. But don't worry, we've still got to get over to Mullins Music and Memories. Mm-hmm. 